What is up, everybody? It's your boy Ian from the litunderground.com, the leader in free and dope literature, psychology, philosophy courses, because we are trying to change the world through books and knowledge. So we made it, everybody, the last official chapter of David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. Wow, I've learned a lot on this reread and having to read it slower and talk about it. Like it has changed my life as I talked about in the sleight of hand video where I started crying. Um, so if you guys are new, go to the link in the description below or watch the intro video on this channel because we are going deep once again today and talking about oral traditions. And we are covering chapter 12, I think, in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. I already talked about that, the real and its wonder. So the first point he talks about, which I thought was really cool, was I'm sure you've experienced this before. You've maybe been on a solo hike or something. You've been out and you've just done nothing. It's just been you and your thoughts and nature and or even a backpacking trip. And then as soon as you hit the first sign of words or even civilization, but in this sense, it was put waste here for David. It throws everything off. Like I remember this happened a couple months ago. I did a huge hike, man, like up to the top of Mount Charleston, the largest peak in Las Vegas, in the Las Vegas Valley. And as I was coming back down, I saw this avalanche sign this or this sign that talks about how the ski like you don't touch rockets that you find because the ski patrol are shooting rockets up there to to for avalanche prevention and i was just like what the hell is going on like why would they why would i find a rocket on the side of this mountain and you know that that kind of shook me out and that has that ever happened to you that's a comment i would like you guys to leave down below today has that have you ever been ripped out how david was ripped out and it's interesting because like I write eco poetry. I am the des the desert poet trying to be the greatest of all time, even though I don't have very much competition, but still trying to be the greatest everybody. And when I'm out there preparing my poetry, I like to sit and like wander around in nature and spend some time out there. And then, you know, I start getting the magical feeling. And then when I start writing poetry, man, that magical feeling starts to go, go away. And because I'm writing poetry, which is like the most magical art of like writing medium of writing, it doesn't go as way away as fast as if I was going to start writing like an essay or something, but it starts to fade and I'm like trying to ride the high and like, I'm trying to get some really good uh, lines out before suddenly I'm just now stuck in the world of symbol and words again. And to get it back, I have to sit and relax even for a couple of minutes and find a nice spot and like, look at some birds or like if you're in the desert, we may not have any birds, but you know, just look around and feel and hopefully, you know, gain that back to, to continue on. So I thought that was really cool. And the rest of this chapter is really talking about oral tradition. And this is such a cool concept. And I really think that David hit all this right on the nail. And he talks about how oral awareness is really just of the local terrain that I am out there being the desert poet because I have lived in the desert 26 out of the 28 years of my life and have spent most of my days for the last 14 years out in the desert. I have experience. I can share that experience through an oral storytelling to like people. And I've done that before. I've taken people out to the desert and shown them a whole new world. And hopefully I'll do that with my writing, but nothing will compare to the times where I've taken people out to the desert and told them the stories that I've experienced. Like one time I was, I, I, I'm one of, I'm novel in progress right now. It's, taking place in Southern Tucson, historical novel, and the Tohono O'odham Native American tribe has something to do with that. And I was like, how the hell am I going like, to get access to the, the Tohono O'odham? And like, not just get their approval to write about them, but just get some good, I'm not, they're like very secondary too. So it's not like I would have to like, I'm, the, yeah, it's not like there's any, they're not really central to the story, but I was like, at the time they were though, I've kind of phased that out, but I'm out in the desert and I, put this intention out there and I'm walking, right? And I'm walking, I'm walking and I never see anybody out there. Like, holy shit. And I walked for a couple hours and then I come back to my car and I'm out in the, like what I mean, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I drove 30 minutes outside of the town, not a building in sight. Then drove 20 minutes out into the desert and then parked my car. I come back and I'm walking and it's like dark now. It's like night. And I see someone walking toward me. And I'm like, oh shit. And it's this lady 
and she's like, hey, hey, and I'm like, hey, and we start talking, and she's like really ethereal and kind of out there, a little bit whim- whimsical, and then she says, I worked for the Tohono Odom for years, and this is where you need to go to get into contact with them. I'm like, well, can I get your phone number? Can I get someone in the tribe's phone number? And she's like, no, I don't really use phones anymore. And I don't know if I don't feel comfortable giving you any, any of their phone numbers because, you know, they're just kind of these, these people who I do know are very reserved. And I was like, all right. And I was like, who the hell was this crazy lady? But then the whole time I'm thinking this girl, is this lady real? And then sure enough, the location and place and people she told me to go and talk to was 100% correct. The place I would have never found but had everything I needed. And they had no idea who this lady was. Was that lady real or not real? Another time I was out in the desert. I'm just going to drop a couple of these stories for you. With weird ladies out in the middle of the desert, dude. Like same type of situation, different location. And I hear beaches. And I'm out there chilling. Like, and it's almost, once again, almost like nocturnal twilight. I'm almost there. I'm walking back here. Beaches, peaches. And I'm like, what the hell? And I see a lady and I'm like, Hey, and she's like, Hey, she's like, have you seen a black cat? And dude, we are like out. Like, like I said, we're like, it's a 30 minute drive on a highway. Like we're a good 40 miles away from civilization. And I'm like, no, I haven't seen a black cat out here. She's like, yeah, I lost my cat over on the other side of Las Vegas Valley, like an hour and a half away. And he was spotted the other day right around this area. I'm like, spotted by who? And who knew it was your cat? I'm like, and she's like, yeah, if you see him, let me know. And that's all she said. And I was like, all right, I'll let you know. And I once again, there was no exchange of it. She didn't say, hey, let me know at barb1 at gmail.com. No, she said, let me know. And so I moved on and left and I never saw her again. Those are stories about the desert, man. Those that's these kind of the weird alien stories are from the desert. Like those are stories that only I can share. Like shit like that doesn't happen maybe out in the woods. Like you don't There's a reason Roswell, Arizona, that alien stories are like run amok because there's like a certain nature and a certain like, you know, there's like more Bigfoot and abduction stories out in the woods and like creepy crazy things, monsters. But out in the desert, it's like Things have to come out of nowhere and like grab you. Um, I mean, was that the, did I make contact with, the, were those ladies, the aliens, everybody? I don't know. But see, these are stories that when I tell someone we're out in the woods at nocturnal twilight and I'm telling them that and like, maybe we'll see somebody tonight. You know, it, it hits a little bit harder, even though I felt like those kind of stories still smack a little bit, even over this virtual reality that you're listening to me through right now. So he, David, he, David Abrams, lays out 10 ways that about 10 things about oral tradition, basically. And the first one is that oral awareness is about the local terrain. We just talked about that. Two is that it is a shared perception. It is us having the perception of the local terrain and something else. It takes two to tango and oops, create a story. We've talked about this the whole time. It's the co-creative experience, if not just with another human, but with a rock. It all is interplay, and we have an impact on it, and it has an impact on us. Number three, animate and inanimate are the same and have all and all have pulses. And this is something that like nobody once again wants to get into. The, one of the only comments I've gotten so far on this course, like in the YouTube comments, is like, "Are rocks and stones really rocks and wood really animate?" and <laughs> I was just like, you know, read the book, man. Like, I don't, like, obviously they are, but to get into the oral world, everybody, that's what, you know, I'm just going to mention this now. To get into this world that we see right here, man, it, there are, to give it life, we have to get rid of the words. To come out here and to see the possibilities, it has to happen through the oral tradition because. It, that tradition comes from the terrain. It is a terrain. It is an extension of that. The, you know, this video is not. It is not that. It is something else. It's an educational tool, but it is not that. So, to 
Number four is that all things speech speak. Each has its own influential and expressive power that even the rock and all these different things, all of them have a place and have their own mode of expression. And then number five, there is subjectivity that if we accept all this, that all of us just have our own perception of this nat natural land and everything. And it, it's a totally subjective world because every blade of grass also has its own form of expression. Six is that the earth is a story and we are the characters, not that we are the stories and the earth is the character, that the earth is the story. The earth is the foundational axiomatic principle and we are just characters in that story and we are going to leave one day and the earth is going to remain. Um, number seven is time is not linear. And that is a very important thing because when you're out there in nature, things move in different ways. It's not cyclical and the different seasons and different places give a different sense of time and what is going on. I mean, even just the seasons and the, the uh, rising and setting of the sun at earlier times or later times all have an influence, but those things aren't linked to time unless we link it to time and really getting back down to this phenomenological awareness requires us to abandon time as much as we can and you know one time of i think in the cosmic trigger series by robert anton wilson he talks about living on it creating his own calendar and living on a new calendar and i think that would be a really cool thing to do honestly is to live on our own calendar i might want to get back into that again man is like what the hell is the calendar man and you know maybe living like on the astrological calendar starting with aries you know first uh, cause that's where, you know, the year starts and with that, or, you know, there's a couple different interpretations, uh, to that, or actually some calendars start in December, uh, astrological calendars eight, we are, excuse me, this is nine, but I, I want sorry, my numbers are screwed up nine. We are immersed in earth's imagination and dreams. If we are characters in the story, that's why we have dreams. That's why it's so impactful to us. We are a part of the story, our dreams, our thoughts, our creativity, can come from us, but it also a lot of the time comes from the earth and it is this living force that is all around us. And last but not least though, our story is our own. We have been given this on earth to chart our own story. All, all of us, all of us subjective beings out there have the ability to chart our own story. And I think that is just like a really cool conclusion. And this is all what builds up the oral tradition that we all have our own story. Like that is if we really look at all this, like the shared perception, it's like share to, to understand oral stories. We have a connection with the coyote. The rocks have life. All things speak. Everything has an opportunity to live. Everything has a subjective angle. The earth is living and we are just characters in it and are under its almost influence and mercy at some level. Time is not linear. Like Native American traditions, a lot didn't even have the concept of time. We are immersed in Earth's imagination and dreams. And that's why dreams and visions are so big and a part of the Native American tradition. And then our story is our own. That's just the classic hero arc that like we can go out and, you know, create our own storyline. And David's recommendation is that we need to acknowledge the mystery and return to natural awareness, everybody. The mystery of the Earth. The mystery that we don't know. Because when you acknowledge that mystery, then... You can move into a different plane of consciousness. We can finally move into this plane where we don't have to know and we can live a non-violent and non-hierarchical life because that's the goal, everybody, is to live a non, you know, live a non-violent and non-hierarchical life and then supplement that with na natural awareness and then that should end 99.9% .9 of the problems on earth. That's the real thing we need to worry about, not about climate change. I mean, that's important too. But bringing that to people and getting that acknowledgement, because if we can't acknowledge that, it's we're not going anywhere. So another cool thing that David talked about was religious texts and how the writing down of sacred texts made all ruined the natural consciousness, and it forced us not to go out and experience all this. Because we have, for instance, I love yoga. I love, you know, the Ramayana for instance, but I am not an Indian and it doesn't really matter if I'm not an Indian, but I've never been to India. I've never spent in, not just, I haven't been, in, I haven't spent years there. I don't really understand those traditions. So they can activate me in a certain way, but desert traditions and desert stories like Dune, Dune spoke to me in a way no book has ever spoken me to me before because it, I felt like I was heard for the first time. Like I was 
spoken to out of natural consciousness because there are a couple uh like sonoran strange there's like a couple books that take place in the desert but dune was the first that or and one of the only that uses the desert to change consciousness through the spice and through the land and that spoke to me and that was a part of my tradition and that awoke me more than books that are objectively better than that book it changed my life and i think that's the same for all these different types of people and if i was I was just told that. Um, I mean, I was I, I read that story to myself. If I was told that story, like just a basic three-hour version of that, I would have my mind blown even more. If I heard about this people and what they were doing, I had this great story to tell them using all aspects of their body, I would have my mind blown. It would be great. And I think that's what we need to search out, everybody, is... And quote, the local earth in effect was the primary mnemonic or memory trigger for remembering the oral tales. And that's what we're missing out on everybody. And the not, not hearing oral tales of, from those around us have muted the land and the power of the land. Us not having oral tales at all in person, but especially ones that take place in our own land have, are causing serious problems to our psychology and to our society. And that's something I want to do in my local community. After I read this, I said, I want to do oral storytelling in the desert of my area, in my area. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I encourage you to do the same thing. Create a meetup group, market it, Instagram page, whatever. Do it with your friends. Do it with your, even if there's just two people, eventually someone else is going to show up if you market it hard enough and make it free and go out there and speak in the land. If you live in the snow, stand out there for, make it 30 minutes long and just everyone says something, tells a story, exuberates themselves out in the land that you all live in. I think it will really change who we are. And so then David lays it all out in three different areas that there's the oral, the local level. Oral tales are like the local level, what we're talking about, like bringing people together. We can, I can help activate people's consciousness through my desert tales and my desert poems and my desert stories. Books are more a cosmopolitan thing that we can understand people in a very wide ranging group and we can take them wherever. And then the digital realm, like what this is, it's global, man. Like I have viewers from all around the world. 100 plus countries who are listening to this right now where, where are you from you know and but it all starts with the oral tales it all starts on a local level i am nothing without the i would not be here i would be a nobody i would just be another employee if i didn't experience what i did in the desert and learn stories and create my own mythology around it that is my base that is literally my axiomatic ground that i am standing on for all creativity i Everything I achieve is because of my relationship to that. And I think the same should be maybe said for you. And if you're trying to make progress, that'd be a great place to start with. Because, you know, you see this with influencers and all these people is that they just seem hollow. They seem empty because they have this digital and global success, but they don't have any roots at home. So let's bring it back locally, everybody. Let's talk to the students. Let's talk about everything that is going on. Let's talk to young people, old people. Let's, you know, bring this back together and make this experience known again. Oral storytelling doesn't need to be relegated to Native American tribes or to just one. It can be all of us, man, because at one point we all were oral storytellers. We all participated in this tradition. So that's it for today, everybody. I'm going to have a conclusion video up. Go check that out because in that there are the book report prompts for your book report that you hopefully are going to write and I am going to read and edit and review. So thank you for being here.